I wait outside of the grocer, holding three fingers to my chest. The streets are empty, and the wind is cruel. I would do much better seeking shelter from the coming blizzard, but the thirst keeps me on the street. A man approaches me. He wears a heavy jacket, but his hands are bare. We briefly speak. His fingers are red and swollen, yet with some effort he positions them. We wait outside of the grocer, each holding two fingers to our chest. Across the road, a young man watches us. His clothes are tattered and his right eye is bruised. He's far too young to be one of us. In a just world, the boy would be off the streets and getting some sort of an education. In a just world, he would have a future. Yet we do not live in a just world. After a minute or two of watching us, the boy crosses the street. He doesn't make eye contact. He just holds a solitary finger to his chest and waits. The air grows violent, each gust of icy wind reminding us that this part of the globe cannot be tamed. We should be huddled around a fire somewhere, far away from the elements, yet the thirst will not let us. The thirst forces us to stand in the blizzard. The three of us wait outside of the grocer, each holding a single finger to our chest. We're waiting for one more, right? Asks the boy. One more, brother. One more. Says the man with the puffy hands. Unless you're feeling like a big spender, that is. The boy doesn't answer. Instead, he takes out a crumpled pack of cigarettes. There's only two left. I try not to stare, but I do. Reluctantly, he offers me one. Eagerly, I accept. The youth lights up his cigarette immediately, but my efforts are foiled by the howling sky. The boy's plastic lighter refuses each spark. I put the cigarette behind my ear and wait for the wind to die down. It doesn't. Real cool, brother, ain't it? Says the man with the puffy hands. He doesn't look me in the eyes. He watches the cigarette. A black car creeps out of the blizzard. Both the make of the vehicle and its governmental plates come from a country that no longer exists. I recognize the car from the years when there used to be a star and sickle on our flag. Those days have passed, yet nothing has changed. A woman wearing a dark lab coat exits the vehicle. She's small in stature, but walks with purpose. Within a couple of quick steps, she's in front of us. Davarishi, she says. There is storm coming. You do not belong on the street. Please, let me take you somewhere warm. Even though her eyes are hidden behind reflective spectacles, I can sense her gaze. She is measuring our character. Not only can I provide food and shelter, I can provide also liquor. Sounds good to me, miss. Lead the way. The man with puffy hands says. The boy and I don't move. Who are you? Asks the boy. Boy, if a kind stranger offers you food and shelter, you just don't ask questions. The man with the puffy hand says. Excuse his manners, miss, we barely know him. It is fair question. The woman says in a voice that doesn't suggest empathy. I am simply Jared the Bosol. I do not believe fellow human beings should have to stand out in cold and suffer. I want to help. Prove it, I say. Buy us a bottle. Her face doesn't twitch. The woman simply processes my request, turns around and walks into the grocer. Well played, brother. The man with the puffy hands says. Well played. The boy's eyes remain glued to the car. Above us something crackles. The curtain of snow and icy wind thickens. I, I don't think we should go with her. The boy finally says. Are you mad? The man with the puffy hands replies. She's bringing us what we want. She'll take us somewhere warm. Do you want to freeze here, boy? I've heard rumors. The youth says. I've heard rumors of a car that travels through the streets and picks up the desperate. Those that enter, they're never seen again. Those that enter go to... Before he can finish his thought, the grocer door opens. The woman silently extends a small bottle of vodka in offering to the boy. Are you? 
He struggles to get his words out. Are you taking us to... The wind stops. Above us, the lamplight flickers. In an instant, the woman retracts her gift from the boy and extends the bottle towards the man with the puffy hands. He does not ask questions. He simply drinks. I've heard talk of the place before. An old science facility belonging to an empire that no longer exists. I've heard tales of curses, of abominations, of forbidden knowledge unearthed. For a moment I wonder whether those stories are true. For a moment I consider whether that strange woman might be connected to the haunted place. Yet those thoughts soon leave me. The man with puffy hands passes the bottle to me. There's not much left, yet even the few sips I salvage send tendrils of a hot peace through my chest. The relief, however, is momentary. My thirst is not quenched. It's simply fortified. Tavarishi, just because your young friend won't join us doesn't mean that my offer is off the table. She says. Come with me, and I will bring you to warmth, food, and the drink that you crave. He's not a friend. The man with a puffy hand says as he moves towards the black car. Farewell, boy. The contents of the bottle have convinced me. Even though the motivations of the woman are questionable, the thirst drags me to the car. I do not look back at the boy. A pane of opaque black glass separates us from the driver and the strange woman. The world beyond the windows is deluded into rough silhouettes. As the car starts moving, the man with the puffy hands let out a series of pleased grunts. Helmer. He introduces himself as he takes off his shoes. Hope you don't mind, brother. Been standing upright far too long today. The car fills with the stench of rot. Past the holes in his socks, I can see the pot marks of needles. I do not comment on the smell. Instead, I ask him where he thinks we're being taken. The way I see, brother, she's going to try to have sex with at least one of us. He says without a shred of irony. Personally, I don't mind. I've been with warriors in my younger years, and if she provides what she promises, I'm happy to take one for the course. Before I have a chance to figure out if Almor is being serious or not, the car halts. We were in the city just moments prior, but the land outside of the vehicle is unrecognizable. A moat of frozen water surrounds us. Around it stand sickly, skeletal trees. From beneath the fallen snow, dead shrubbery juts out like clawing fingers of restless corpses. Beyond us stands a concrete shack with a large metal door. The woman makes her way towards the building without looking back. After waiting for Almor to put his shoes back on, we both follow her. The wind outside is brutal but the thick cement walls of the structure make the elements irrelevant. As soon as the metal doors close behind us, the roar of the blizzard is hushed down beneath the gentle buzz of fluorescent lighting. The inside of the concrete structure is a singular hallway leading to a set of elevator doors. Everything around us echoes the soulless pragmatism of Soviet architecture, yet in one corner of the hallway there's a taste of hospitality, an electric heater, food, drink. Almor immediately leaps at the offerings. Tavarishi, I hope you find supplies sufficient for a moment. She says as the red coils of the heater dance across her spectacles. In order to access true shelter, however, I will need some information for your entry paperwork. The process should take less than an hour, and I assure you rooms downstairs are more comfortable than hallway. Is this... The words scratch against my throat. It's as if the universe itself was trying to censure me. Is this... The fluorescent lights above us flicker. The electric heater hisses. She turns to face me. All that I'm met with is my own miserable reflection. Every fibre of my being wants to let go of the question and indulge in the gifts. But before I can turn away, the woman speaks. We do not live in a just world. She says. This building, the mere existence of the... It alone is evidence of the cruel universe which we inhabit. Horrid research was conducted here many years ago. The earth is still sick with the 
echoes of that dark science. The walls weep for the suffering countless innocents had to face here. Yes, your young friend was correct. This is Yet he was wrong to assume I mean you harm. Dovarishi, I only want to shield you from the cold and from your cravings. My colleagues who wait below only want to provide good life for you and all others who suffer on the streets. It is only by spreading kindness in these halls, by reasserting our humanity, that we can cleanse the spirit of this inhuman place. Well said, miss. Well said. Almo says as he tears into a packet of melted chocolate bars near the heater. Come sit here, brother. Let us not bother our charitable hosts more than we have to. I sit down by the heater. The warmth of the machine calms my doubts. With one pull of the bottle, any amount of suspicion dissolves into irrelevance. I give the woman whatever information she requires, as does Elmo. The woman once again tells us to enjoy the food and drink, and then disappears down the elevator to process our paperwork. I reach for the pile of chocolate bars, but instead of unwrapping them, I simply load up my pockets. My stomach is entirely too nervous for food, yet I know what will calm it. I reach for one of the vodka bottles. The seal is broken, and for a split second I question whether the liquor has been tampered with, but with a single taste I forget my worries. My spirit calms. With each pull of the bottle the pain passes from my joints. My mind clears, the world softens around its edges as my thirst is satiated and I surrender my body to the soothing sharpness of the liquor. Almur continues to ponder about the possibility of being a gigolo, but I do not listen to him. I simply embrace the drunkenness. It's as if an itch in the back of my throat has been scratched, an empty pit in my stomach filled. I feel whole. I feel whole and relaxed and significantly more tired than I thought I was. Almu's drunken mumbles prove to be a steady, low lullaby. I start to nod off. Yet as sleep starts to wrap its fingers around me, another sensation shivers in my chest. Past the sleepy drunken bliss comes a new craving. The cigarette behind my ear. My lungs ask for it. I'm far too tired to open my eyes, let alone light up a cigarette. I try to ignore my chest and listen to Almo's slurred philosophizing, but the hunger for the smoke is too strong. I pry my eyes open and reach for the cigarette. My hand misses. Almo's shoes are off once more. His diseased feet are bloody red in the glare of the heater. He's not speaking anymore, he's just babbling, drifting back and forth through consciousness. My hand misses again. I realize I can't feel my fingers. His head droops as if his neck was broken, but Almor makes an effort to look me in the eye. Brother. He says, struggling with each syllable. Brother, maybe the boy was right. My limbs feel completely foreign to me. I barely managed to get on my feet. Brother, I don't think that bitch was honest with us. I think we've been... Poisoned. I try saying the word out loud, but my tongue refuses to move. Instead of words, all that leaves in my mouth is spittle. The world is heavy. Each step I take is a discomforting leap of faith, but I will myself towards the metal door. Brother. I hear him moaning, but I don't look back. The path before me spins. Even past the numbness, I can feel a feverish sweat flowing down my back. Brother, what about me? The entirety of my willpower is spent on opening the door. It takes the entire weight of my numb body to move the handle. By the time I feel the freezing wind on my face, I am spent. My body allows for two more steps before it goes limp. The dead shrubbery reaches out for me from the frozen ground. I know I am in no state to escape. I know I can't make it back to the city. The panicked voice of my self-preservation goes quiet. And I know I'm doomed. For a moment I consider crawling back inside and accepting whatever fate the scientist has in store for me, but I'm far too exhausted. I stay outside, leaned up against the partially open door. 
It's cold, but my eyes close regardless. I hope that memories of friends and good nights will keep me warm. And they do. The numbness in my body allows me to relax. I accept my fate and let my mind take me far away from... I remember my schoolyard days. My parents, past loves, the warm summer nights spent in good company. And for a moment, with my mind diminished by the poison in my veins, I almost feel happy. But then, I hear the elevator door open. Almore yells something, but it's incomprehensible. Heavy stomps and the grinding of metal drown his pleas for help out. The thuds from inside the building sober me slightly. I once again consider escaping into the forest, but I find myself unable. Not only am I still seized with the weakness, but my sweaty palms have interwoven themselves with the cold metal of the door. The heavy footfalls stop, but Almor's pleas don't. I hear the woman say something to him, but I can't hear her properly. There's something else in the hallway with them. Something that breathes heavy and low. Something that moves with the sound of grinding gears. I lean over and look inside the building. I gaze into... Adrenaline cuts across my veins like a razor-sharp knife. I see the creature. I see it grab the man with the puffy hands in its drooping maw. The woman in the lab coat watches, calmly taking notes on her clipboard. As the creature feeds, its body expands like a horrid balloon made of flesh. The metal coating around the beast's limbs grinds and snaps as the abomination drains the innocent man. Almur's face twists into a pained grimace. His face grows pale, his hands grow white. The pleas for help stop. The sight of the feeding frenzy awakens a new will to live within my heart. Before the life leaves Almor's eyes, my palms sprout blood. I run. I run through the snow, leaving a part of myself frozen to the metal door. I stumble, and I fall, but my body does not relent. My veins are filled with poison, my coat is caked in blood, yet I do not stop running. I know I am leaving behind a crimson trail. I know my steps cut a trail through the mountains of snow, but I keep on running. I keep on running because the alternative is incomprehensible. The jagged shrubs give way to sickly woods. The sickly woods strengthen into a healthy forest covered in snow. By the time I reach a road, I cannot run anymore. My heart does not calm, it still demands my legs do whatever they can to escape the cruel woman and her monstrosity. But all I can manage is a staggered walk. By the side of the road, I find an abandoned warehouse. I stumble inside in hopes of survival. The last thing I see before my consciousness fully departs is a group of men gathered around a fire. I dream of the thing. As my body wrestles with the effects of laced alcohol and exhaustion, the visage of the revolting beast refuses to leave me. The grinding of rusted metal strains its way into a universe of throbbing flesh. Incomprehensible shapes of raw meat and arteries haunt me as I drift in and out of consciousness. At times I start to believe I never escape the beast. There's moments within my fevered battle when I'm certain that I've died and my body is simply rattling in some grisly afterlife of oozing flesh and corroded metal. Yet slowly, ever so slowly, sunlight seeps into my world. You're awake. A familiar face with peach fuzz and a bloated eye greets me. Thank the Lord you're awake. What a horrid state you came in. I knew that woman was dangerous. My body feels hollow and defeated, but I have control over my limbs once more. In the corner of the warehouse, a group of men warm themselves at a makeshift fire barrel. The boy explains they helped him tend to me after my sickly arrival. He tells me I'm lucky. I agree. As I rediscover control of my body, I also rediscover the candy bars in my pocket. Their packaging seems intact. As I describe Almo's fate to the youth, I offer him some of the chocolates. At first he seems nervous about the food, but we're both too hungry to be paranoid. There are no words to properly capture the maddening form of the beast I'd witnessed. Even past my struggle to verbalize the insanity, however, the youth understands. Sounds like you need a drink, he says. That should help you forget. 
right? We laugh, but the merriment doesn't last. Soon enough, the joke about the thirst becomes an unavoidable part of reality. In a just world, this experience will be enough to make me reject the bottle, but we do not live in a just world. As we walk towards the city, we make idle chatter about the state of the world, yet each gap in conversation grows longer than the last. When we leave the warehouse, the sun is shining in the sky, but by the time we reach the grocer, the heavens are a shapeless sea of grey. The thirst makes sober conversation far too strenuous. We stand outside of the grocer, waiting for a couple of strangers to split a bottle with. We stand outside of the grocer, each holding two fingers to our chest. In the basement, right by the washing machine, I have a little cardboard box that I visit whenever I need a break from reality. Collecting offbeat VHS tapes might seem like a quirky hobby, but I've always taken some amount of pride to marching to the beat of my own drum. After all, there's a section of the population out there that likes to keep deadly snakes and poisonous insects as pets. Wouldn't say that what I do registers as particularly weird in the grand scope of humanity. I have always thought of my hobby as something harmless I do, to take the edge off, as a means of injecting a sense of mystery into my day-to-day -day life. Yet as I sit here trying to make sense of the tape I watched this afternoon, my quirky hobby feels a lot more sinister than it usually does. Weird doesn't even begin to cover it. Shaman Tape B1 I bought the tape during one of my eBay shopping sprees months ago, but I kept its contents for a special occasion a time when I would really need a break from my regular life. That time came this afternoon. Calling my wife a dog person would be an understatement. Just about every ounce of her maternal instinct is laser focused on our two-year-old cocker, Betty. Laura shows that dog so much affection that I occasionally feel like a third wheel in their relationship. My wife also marches to a different drum beat. Hers just happens to be the beat of an excited sausage tail hitting the kitchen cupboard when lunch is being cooked. She tolerates my VHS tapes. I tolerate her obsession with the dog. Usually it works out. Usually. Laura was meant to have her weird dog friends over with their weird dogs for some weird dog socialization party. That morning she kept complaining about how Betty has been misbehaving over the past couple of weeks. Her lengthy over-analyzing of the dog's behavior doesn't usually bother me, but this morning she decided that I was the reason why the dog doesn't listen to us. Apparently I've been feeding Betty too many treats and spoiling her. Laura did not take kindly to my suggestion that the dog might just be spoiled from her treating it like a toddler. By the time the weird dog people started to arrive at our house, I was already hidden in the basement. I was still amped up from the argument, but the cool air and gentle smell of laundry detergent calmed me soon enough. Upstairs, strangers were baby talking to animals in horrid pitches, but by the time the ancient television flickered on, I was already in my happy place. I picked out the shaman tape almost instantly. It was as if the words on the labeling reached out to me, as if they were taunting me with their mystery. Shaman Tape B1 I pushed the tape into the VCR and prepared to see something weird. Blank spots at the start of a tape have always been marks of quality for people with my taste. It means that the tape is not meant for public consumption. It meant that we are not the intended audience. In a media landscape where every bit of content is laser focused on reaching its desired demographic bubble, a VH tape of something you're not meant to see is worth its weight in gold. The waves of static drifted across the monitor like an infinite digital ocean. I was no longer in a house filled with dogs. I was in a journey to see something forbidden. A lit up stage flashed into existence on the screen. The footage was grainy and mute suggesting a film reel from the earliest 20th century, but the man who stood on the stage, he felt timeless. He wore a tall feathered headdress and a long, unkept beard. In front of him, he had a little drum that he would absentmindedly tap from time to time. 
He wasn't focused on his instrument, though. His attention was elsewhere. He was looking directly into the camera. As grainy as the footage was, the shaman's stare was unavoidable. There was a suffering melancholy in his eyes. It was as if he was lying at the scene of a car crash and was looking up at someone who could help but decided not to. It felt like we were in the same room. He was gazing deep into my soul. We stared at each other. There was a screen between us, and even beyond that screen, there were decades of technological advancements, but the shaman from the film reel was looking straight into my eyes. For a couple seconds we just stood there, two men divided by media and time, holding uncomfortable eye contact. Then the shaman started to sing. The tape had been silent until that point and the volume of the television was turned down to a whisper, but I heard the shaman's song loud and clear. A steady low drone came from the depths of the man's throat and echoed through my skull. His hand started to tap against the drum and rhythm. This is why I watched these tapes. For a moment I was elsewhere. For a moment I wasn't in a house filled with dogs. I was in an empty auditorium staring off with a sad mystic. I was somewhere weird. But then the barking started. A short burst of growls escalated into frantic yelling. Something was happening upstairs. I wasn't in the midst of a mystic experience anymore. I was just some dude watching a VHS tape beneath a weird dog party. Ryan! My wife yelled from upstairs. Ryan, come here! What is it? I yelled back. Ryan, come upstairs! It's serious! Begrudgingly, I got off the couch and walked up the stairs. Laura was holding the dog by the collar, scarcely managing to hold her balance under the animal's excitement. Betty's mouth was wide open and her eyes were darting from side to side. The dog was eager to play, it seemed. She got into a fight. My wife hissed, straddling that fine line between yelling and a whisper. I told you there was something wrong with her. Who's oversensitive now? I shrugged. Past the dog-filled chatter from the living room, I still heard the shaman's song echoing in my head. I was eager to return to the basement. What do you want me to do? Take her with you so she doesn't start up again. Check her for bite marks. We pulled them off each other right away, but... <sighs> Look, just make sure. If you see any blood, call me. She hooked the dog's collar around my hand. The animal was clearly just excited, but my wife looked as if Betty had been diagnosed with something terminal. I'm going to calm everything down, but we need to deal with this right after the party, Ryan. This isn't how a regular dog behaves. Betty needs a therapist. She just seems excited, that's all, I said. Laura did not find my counter-argument worth responding to. She just stomped off to her weird dog friends. Betty was irritated when I didn't let her follow my wife, but by the time I let the dog into the basement, she was back in good spirits. As soon as she jumped off the stairs, she was running circles around the couch, panting with pent-up excitement. As I made my way down the stairs, however, my attention quickly shifted away from the dog. The flickering scream dimmed everything else in the room. A small crowd of people in battered clothes stood behind the shaman. They sang some sort of miserable hymn and looked just as tortured as the throat-singing mystic, yet their expression differed in one unavoidable aspect. They weren't watching me. The shaman was. Past the screen of my bulky television, past the film grain and the years between us, the shaman was looking straight at me. His eyes followed every movement that I made down the stairs. In the depths of my soul, I knew what he wanted. He wanted me to understand. He wanted me to comprehend the suffering so clearly painted on his face. I sat down on the couch, ready to be sucked into the mystery of the VHS tape. The rest of the universe fizzled out. I was fully committed to listening to the shaman, to understanding his pain, to indulging in the forbidden tape. But then Betty jumped on my lap. She sat there for a grand total of half a second and then leaped back onto the floor and started racing around the basement like a wild animal. I tried turning my attention back to the shaman and ignoring the frenzied dog, but when Betty nearly knocked over my television, I knew something had to be done. Betty! I yelled. She didn't listen to me. Instead, she grabbed one of my slippers and jumped around, challenging me to chase her. Betty! I yelled, again, this time taking a treat out of my pocket. The slipper dropped to the floor. In an instant, I had the dog's complete, undivided attention. Please don't be a bitch, I said, and threw her the bribe. It was one of those rubbery bones that advertise with a pearly-toothed Labrador. Chewing on the treat would occupy her for a good couple of minutes. Satisfied with the dog's gnawing, I turned my attention back to the shaman. He continued to hold his low, throaty note and tap his drum, staring deep into my soul. The crowd around him grew. 
Between the flickers of the screen as if spliced into the film reel itself, new gaunt faces started to appear on the stage behind the suffering mystic. There would always be a moment of shock when they found themselves standing by the shaman, but soon enough they all joined the chorus accompanying the mystic's performance. Betty was chewing on a dental treat next to me, but the dog's snarling was drowned out by the haunted hymn bleeding out of my television. I did not understand the words that the chorus sang, but I found myself mouthing along. The room grew even dimmer, dragging all of my focus towards the television. A wave of static washed through my ears like a gust of wind. I found myself shivering. I found myself numb. A concerned growl came from next to me, but Betty was gone. The world beyond the television was impossible to focus on. My whole body was starting to grow faint. The shaman's eyes were begging me to join him on the screen. I accepted his invitation. The reality of my basement drifted apart like dying smoke. For a mere moment, I felt Betty's paws press into my lap. Before her weight disappeared off my body, she let out a single anxious bark. It was as if she was saying goodbye. I found myself standing somewhere incomprehensible. The air was heavy and cold. The universe before me existed in shapeless suggestion. From the blurry outline, I could tell apart the swaying of the shaman in his tired chorus, but there was someone else in the room with me, someone who stood next to me. His mustache was well trimmed and he wore a clean lab coat, but his eyes were just as miserable and piercing as the shaman's. Leave, the scientist said his voice drenched in a foreign accent. You do not belong here. Leave now or you will be trapped forever. Leave now or you will forever sing. I opened my mouth to ask about the nightmare I was stuck in, to understand where I was, but no words came from my lips. The sudden realization that I was not in control of my body hit me like a crumbling brick. I opened my mouth again. I opened my mouth again in an effort to ask for a way out to demand escape from the steadily sharpening image of the shaman in his chorus. This time words came from my lips, but they weren't the ones I had intended to vocalize. I am sorry, friend, the scientist said. I am sorry you have to share our curse. And then he, too, started to sing. Before me, I could see the shaman. He was no longer in a universe of film grain. He was a real man standing in front of me in the flesh. Looking into his pale eyes, I finally understood his sadness. I understood that he was trapped inside of the VHS tape. I understood that I would be trapped with him until the end of time, singing that horrible song. Thoughts of the woman that I loved, of her dog, of the weird friend she kept. They felt like distant memories from a warm, detergent-scented universe I would never see again. I knew that I would spend the rest of eternity singing words I did not understand in an inescapable, tortured chorus. Eternity came to close with a crash. I was back in my basement. Before me stood an overactive cocker spaniel. Her little sausage tail was beating against the side of my broken television. The loud crash brought a premature end to the weird dog party. As soon as my wife saw her fur baby standing in a mess of broken glass, she kicked all of her weird dog friends out and spent the rest of the afternoon checking Betty's paws for shards of glass. She yelled at me for not looking after Betty properly, but my wife's anger didn't last long. She was more concerned about getting our dog behavioral therapy. As she checked the animal's paws for the umpteenth time, she decided it was time for Betty to get a trainer. I didn't argue. I was too preoccupied thinking about what I had seen on the VCR. I didn't tell Laura about the tape or the shaman. For starters, I didn't want her questioning my mental state, but I also was still making sense of what happened. That hasn't changed. I'm still trying to comprehend of what I've witnessed in the basement. My VHS tapes help me unwind and they give me that glimpse of a bizarre corner of the universe which I so desperately crave. But the footage from has been far too much. Even as I tap out these words on my screen, a shiver travels up my spine at the mere thought of what I had witnessed. There's no way that I'm ever letting go of my hobby, but if I ever come across anything to do with on my late night eBay shopping sprees, I'll be sure to look for my forbidden kicks elsewhere. Usually Betty follows my wife to bed and sleeps at her feet, but tonight my wife sleeps alone. Betty has been obsessively tailing me ever since she tipped over the television. It's like she knows that she saved me from an eternity of misery behind a screen. It's like she's expecting a reward. 
I give the dog another treat. As soon as a faux bone is in Betty's jowl, she runs to the bedroom to chew on her prize. I sincerely hope that the dog snarling doesn't wake up my wife. The last thing I need right now is another argument. Outside of the dog's gnawing, the only other sound in this tranquil suburban night is the hum of our fridge. Underneath that mechanical purr, however, there's something else. Hidden within that familiar buzz, I hear something foreign. The shaman's low, throaty song still echoes through my soul. For a moment, I try to listen to it. I try to understand it. But then I stop. The mustachioed scientist was right. I don't belong in the demented realm of the shaman's tape. I belong in my bed, next to my wife, with her misbehaving dog at our feet. I should get some sleep. No one has ever questioned my loyalty. In return, I have never questioned my orders. For decades, my comrades and I have enacted the will of the Kremlin in places where the Kremlin could not be seen. We shed our colors, our names, our identity. We were all willing to die in complete anonymity for the greater good of the homeland. The weight of the sacrifices we have made were immeasurable, but necessary. We stopped this land from descending into chaos. We immolated ourselves at the altar of order and control, hoping that one day we would be remembered as heroes. They're all dead. Everyone who came with me to this cursed corner of the globe is dead and I am left as the sole survivor of the horror we have witnessed. For nearly two decades, I have sat in this disgusting basement that smells of death, waiting for a word from my superiors. I have spent years waiting for some sort of debriefing, some sort of explanation for what had happened that fateful night. I expected someone to come back and bring me back home. I expected proper treatment for my wounds, a pension, at least a quiet recognition for my loyalty. But none came. My supervisors have abandoned me and left me to rot. I swore an oath to never speak of any of the operations I was a part of. But what good is a loyal man's oath when he swears it to thieves and liars? Perhaps me writing this post will result in an unfortunate fall from a window, or a heart attack delivered by the tip of an umbrella. If that is the case, then so be it. Every man must die, and I would rather die by state-sponsored violence than because of what lingers beneath my bandages. I used to do wet work for the Russian military. I am the sole survivor of the massacre. This is my story. It was the summer of 2002, and I'd been dispatched beyond the new borders to Central Asia. As usual, everyone on the team was given a local passport and false documentation. If we were to be caught, there would be no connection to a foreign government. For all intents and purposes, I belonged to a group of concerned local citizens who had access to high-grade military equipment. The area that we were meant to be concerned about was the building formerly known as the United People's Institute of Science, or, as the superstitious locals called it, the In its former glory, the United People's Institute of Science was one of the most revered Soviet scientific installations. The greatest minds of the East all gathered in a single underground facility and researched concepts that would help the Soviets get an upper hand in the war. The Institute always operated on a relatively self-governing basis. Yet once the borders of our sphere of influence started to readjust in 1989, communication with the facility went completely dark. There were bigger problems than rogue scientific installations after the wall fell. 
when the Soviet Union finally collapsed. Any paperwork concerning the Institute's existence went to rot in archives that few would ever visit. Official oversight of the Institute ceased to exist, yet the facility continued to operate in its own special way. The rumors were a mainstay of local gossip. Stories of insane scientists, of disappearances of strange creatures roaming the woods. Nothing particularly alarming for an uneducated community next to a secret research facility. Aside from the Institute, the only other notable things in the nearest city were a handful of factories and an old burned-down hotel. Bored people in desolate conditions tend to have colorful imaginations. For decades, the rumors were ignored. After 91, however, the talk about the Institute changed. For one, it was no longer referred to as the Institute. To the locals, the building was now known as the The rumors, much like the name, changed in their form. The locals no longer spoke of vague monsters and ethereal plots. They spoke of specific missing people, of livestock showing up bloodless in the fields, of a specific part of the forest from which none returned. The locals' abstract stories hardened into matching descriptions. When digital cameras became cheap enough to be a hobbyist item, the photographs started to emerge. They were grainy, and there were no guarantees that they weren't doctored. Yet at that point, this started to catch the attention of the decision makers. The rumors caught the eye of those in power. Yet on closer inspection, there was something more concerning about the Institute. According to the few official documents that could be unearthed, the United People's Institute of Science was not just a research facility. There were two missile silos attached to the structure. This so-called was deemed a threat to national security. The channels from the provincial government pointed to a culture of drunkenness and ineptitude. We were brought to the city without any express permission from anyone noteworthy. Our mission was to assess and take control of the If we were to be caught or killed, we would be forever known as very concerned citizens. We were organized into a 12-man team. Our handler set us up in the basement of a hospice. I didn't recognize any of the men present, except for one, the Sibiriak. Two years prior, we had both been part of a particularly messy operation near the Mongolian border, where he had saved my life. I have met a lot of dangerous men throughout my career, but the Sibiriak towered over them all, both in stature and in capacity for violence. The directives for our mission were vague at best, but knowing that that Siberian giant was on our side eased my mind. I had seen him kill. As long as he was on the same side as me, I considered myself safe. Even though we were in the basement of the hospice, the cries of the sick still reached our ears. I joined the rest of the team in a friendly game of cards and some light drinking, using a radio to drown out the wails of the dying. The mood in the basement was reasonably calm. Everyone was blowing off steam before the mission, with one exception. The Sibiriak did not join us for the card game or the vodka. He simply sat at the top of the stairs, listening to the pain of strangers. It was as if he knew we would soon join them in their torture. The United People's Institute of Science was a particularly subterranean structure with only a guardhouse and a small lobby with an elevator shaft leading down. The plan was simple. Two men were to covertly make their way to the guardhouse, neutralize the sole member of security, 
and then the rest of the team was meant to advance toward the Institute under the cover of night. The operation was a mess from the beginning. The two men chosen to deal with the security guard were young and indecisive, and the security guard himself acted erratically. Most civilians immediately cooperated at the sight of a rifle. The security guard did not. As soon as the two greenhorns approached, he started yelling about them having no authority here. Instead of surrendering, he picked up the phone and called his supervisors. By the time they shot him, he had alerted the Institute to trouble. The monotone voice of the commanding officer in our earpieces ordered us to advance on the facility. It was a pitch-dark night, with not even a hint of the moon in the sky. Yet the night vision goggles turned the incomprehensible dark world into a navigatable sea of greeny green. The Institute was located in the middle of a dense forest, yet the land around the actual structure was completely barren. There was no cover. We were like heavily armored lambs moving toward a dead, quiet slaughterhouse. An announcement of our arrival was not optimal, but the sort of work I was in rarely went according to plan. Robbed of the element of surprise, we moved on the Institute from opposing directions in two groups of five. I was in the back of the Eastern Formation with the Sibiriak directly in front of me. The hulking giant offset any discomfort I had at the announcement of our arrival. I thought myself safe. As we moved across the dead ground, my earpiece sounded off with the commander's voice and the occasional whispered apology from the guardhouse group. No movement from the Institute. For a moment, I found myself experiencing something akin to calmness. Then, I heard a voice in my earpiece that didn't belong there. Dovarishi, turn back. A female voice. A calm voice, a motherly voice. Tavarishi, turn back, or in the name of I will be forced to take drastic action. No one stopped. The fact that an outsider was able to speak on our frequency was highly unusual. But we knew better than to pay attention to orders that didn't come from our superior. We moved to the backup frequency. The voice followed but its tone had changed. Tovarishi, she said in a voice so cold and sharp that it would make even the Siberian before me twitch. This is your last warning. If you keep approaching the Kundali Kundur, you will find a fate worse than death. Turn back and never return. I have never disobeyed an order. I take pride in the fact that I am a reliable member of the armed forces, but that voice, there was something unearthly about it. Something horribly malicious that I could not comprehend. My rifle started to shake. My steps became uneasy. For the first time since I enlisted, I found myself truly disturbed. Davari. I ripped my earpiece out. Even now, as I write this, I cannot explain what I thought becoming death to the voice would achieve. I ripped out my earpiece in blind instinct in a frenzied attempt to retreat from that which had poisoned my soul with fear. The Sibiriak kept moving. In the field of coarse green, I could see the rest of the troop progressing as well. I was only a meter or two behind the formation but it was clear that I was the only one who had lost their composure. With shame in my heart, I tried to catch up with the rest of the group. Dovarishi. A dark, horrid voice had boomed through my head. You have been warned. You have refused to see reason. Now you shall pay the price. But my earpiece was out. It was as if the foreign voice had been lodged into my skull. Before my mind had even managed to properly register the psychic intrusion, there was something else to contend with. The ground beneath us shook. The earth swelled in a dark circle around the Institute and caved in. I saw my comrades fall into a sudden ditch of murky water. 
my nose filled up with the smell of an infected wound. Whatever liquid they had fallen into was potent with filth. If I had been standing behind the Sibiriak as I was meant to, I would have fallen as well. I would have ended up in that same horrid water, as everyone else did. My moment of hesitation is the only reason that I survived that night. The Sibiriak screamed. As terrified as I was, I quickly reached down and offered him a helping hand. The man had saved my life a couple of years prior. It was only fitting that I would help him out of the ditch that he had fallen into. Getting the giant out of the water proved to be much more strenuous than expected. His weight was quite a burden to contend with, and much like the rest of the team, he was thrashing around in the water, unable to stand up on his own. To help him out, I had to descend into the ditch myself and plant one foot into the water for leverage. This helped the Sibiriak up, but as soon as my boot was submerged in the water, I could understand all of the thrashing about. Just a bit of the dark water had gotten into my boot, but the pain was instant. The liquid was cold, but the moment it soaked through my sock, it was as if I was standing on burning coals. The stench of sickness and the pain seized me so strongly that I nearly vomited. Yet I kept my composure and crawled out of the ditch among the rest of my comrades. Our commander was yelling orders for us to advance on the facility, yet his orders were soon drowned out. You have entered forces which you cannot comprehend. You will feel the wrath of the- The doors of the facility flew open. The instinct to open fire came as quickly as the order did. Bright flashes broke through the world of green. The quiet forest filled with the sound of gunfire. Yet by the time our rifles went quiet, nothing had changed. We stood there in silence facing down the cement building in the middle of a forest with nothing but the echo of our guns to keep us company. That's when I noticed that the Sibiriak was shaking. One of his hands was off his weapons and scratching across his back. He wasn't the only one. The rest of the team, even those approaching the Institute from the opposite side, were all clawing at their bodies. Weapons started to fall to the ground. The scratching amplified to manic fits. They were no longer a group of soldiers ready for combat. The Sibiriak turned around and faced me. I have seen many things throughout my life. Things that would force most civilians into eternal sleeplessness. Yet nothing compared to the sight of the Sibiriak's face that night. His usually vacant gray eyes were filled to the brim with fear. His face was covered in dark red splotches that seemed like the aftermath of some horrid childhood accident. Out of those crimson marks came writhing life. Worms, frenzied worms with small black eyes stemmed from his face, pulling further and further out of his body. He opened his mouth to scream, but his jaw it, too, was filled with the parasites. The Sibiriak was not the only one. All around me, my comrades were trying to rip away the foreign life crawling in their skin. They tried to scream, yet all their wide-open mouths let out were whimpers and more of those writhing maggots. Tavarish, you have not heeded my warnings, and now you will pay the price. The voice boomed into my skull. The is not to be trifled with. Something squeezed its way out of the doors of the Institute. I raised my rifle to fire. Yet my eyes slipped down to the ground. The thing was moving towards our group, but I couldn't. I, I just couldn't stand to look at it. It moved towards us. I could see my comrades were suffering. I could see they needed help. Yet I couldn't face that horrid creature that had left this cursed place. I ran. I ran as fast as I could to save my life. Flesh, bone, blood. 
As I looked over my shoulder, I couldn't tell where the remnants of my comrades ended and where the beast began. I ran blindly into the forest, hoping that whatever was killing my brothers at arms wouldn't follow me. It didn't. Yet, as my struggling breath reached its limits, another problem presented itself. Even though my body was shivering with adrenaline, the burning pain in my foot was starting to make itself known again. I hid next to a forest stream, with my rifle at the ready, and kicked off my boot. Beneath my sock, a mess of life squirmed. The worms. They were the same exact worms that consumed the Sibiriac just moments before. They were consuming my foot and slowly spreading toward my calves. Instinct. The same instinct that forced me to rip out my earpiece was now driving me to act. I found a piece of wood in the stream and fished out my combat knife. I placed the wood in my mouth and bit down. I knew what I had to do, but I also knew that the beast that was lurking by the would hear me and all of my pain would be worthless. The details of how I made my way back to the hospice escaped me. My handler kept me on enough morphine for the whole month after the mission to stay a distant memory. I loosely recall pulling my body through the jagged gravel of a road toward the city. I loosely recall being loaded in the back of a car. I loosely recall the surgery to amputate the rest of my leg. What I do remember with absolute clarity is my handler thanking me for my service and asking me to stay put until someone came to retrieve me. That was almost two decades ago. I recall that promise with sharp memory because I have thought about it each and every night. I have been loyal. I have waited. I have even tried to establish contact with the local embassy. Yet no one would claim me. For years I have been a man living in the basement of a hospice, praying that I would not have to die here. Yet those illusions are starting to leave me. Beneath my bandages I can feel it again. The worms. The amputation has only slowed their progress. Beneath my bandages I can feel them wriggling again. They have come to finish what they started. During the massacre. Hello, I want to say the big thank you to everyone who has sent photograph of dog. Pictures from all over the world have come and they have helped. It makes me very happy to see pictures of Australian dog and Brazilian dog and British dog. If situation was different, this would be very funny. But situation is not different. I am still suffering. The pain is growing very strong every day. It feels like they're dying. <clears throat> Thank, thank you for your help, but please, I ask you, send more photographs of dog. For those that do not know me, I am a man living in ex-Soviet Republic. I have had very bad accident at... <laughs> Photograph of dog is the only thing that is medicine. Please, please send. Before the accident, I, I was only living with dog in apartment. Her name is Dasha, and she is Springer Spaniel Lady Dog. She has very kind eyes, but she is very she is very naughty. It, it is because of Dasha that the accident happens. I am not angry at her. I, I love her. I should have been more careful. I should have listened to the stories about... I work home from computer, 
Last week there was a big project. I spent many hours on computer. Desha is apartment dog, but her soul she is the hunting dog. She make the barking at me a lot when I have to go to work and she see I am busy. She sleep. She naughty dog, but she good dog. After a big project, I decide I will reward Desha. I will give her many treat, but I am also promise her running. Where I live is big housing project with cement and factory. It is not good for the running. It is not good for dogs. I borrow my cousin car and we drive from city to forest. Closest forest to city is not very far. Not many people visit because the is near. When I was growing up, I heard many stories about it from uncles. They say it's all science building from the Stalin time. They say it's a bad place. They tell a scary story. I never believe. <laughs> Even as a child, I think I am a rational man. When they warn me not to go to I, I think they are being idiots. When we arrive at the edge of forest, Desha runs like a bullet. She is full of excitement and athletic dog. I try to run after her, but I am not very athletic. I call for her, but she is not listening. Desha is a kind dog. When even she was puppy, she didn't listen. I do not mind, you know. I know she will run around and come back, but while Dasha does the running, I walk through the forest. It is very peaceful. Sometimes I hear her jumping, but it's mainly birds. Air is nice and warm, and you can smell factory. It's nice. The trees are very nice and green, and while walking, I'm feeling very nice and good. It's nice. I start to think that maybe forest isn't just good for Dasha, but maybe good for me also. After walking for a quarter of hour or two quarter hour, walking the forest starts to get strange. Birds stop. Trees start to look sick. Gentle wind disappear and start to smelling like bad swamp. Deshi has better nose than me, but she does not for caring. She, she keeps going. She keeps on running through the dead leaves and having the fun. I watch her smile and play and I smile too. But then I... I stop smiling. I see the... It is big cement house, no windows, only one big door. The trees around it are dead on the ground. It has parking lot but no road. Inside there is a, a moat, big hole filled with water that is very dirty. It smells like infected wound. I yell for Desha to come back but she is too curious. She climbs up on one of the fallen tree and jumps over the water to the... The building makes me very scared and I don't want Desha to get hurt. I, I, I yell more but she is not listening. With leash I try across the same dead tree Desha cross but there is problem. Her little dog legs are not as heavy as my man feet. The tree is breaking and I fall into dirty water. It does not feel like just water. As soon as I am landing I, I feel pain. It is like acid on my skin. I yell and I scream. Tasha did not listen for me to calling her name, but when I yell in fear she ran over to like an emergency to me. I quickly climb out of water so Tasha does not feel same pain. I want to keep her safe. Getting out of dirty water does not stop pain, but is hurting less. As soon as Tasha sees I am safe she runs again, but toward car. With wet and painful footstep I walk back to cousin car. When falling into water I was very unhappy. I thought fall and dirty water was the worst part of my day. I was being wrong. When I get home I throw away all my clothes and get concerned. Where the water touched there is boil. My skin looked like mushroom. Even slight touch cause hurt. Desha is sleeping when we get home. But when she sees me going to kitchen she follows. I put garlic and honey on the skin hoping for healing. It does not help. The garlic just makes pain worse and honey is very sticky. When I put honey on my feet, Desha licked them but still hurt. I decide to take shower. When I see myself in bathroom mirror, I become even more concerned. My skin turning very red, very big and there are very hard white dots everywhere. Touching them very painful. When I get in shower, cold water feel good. But it does not feel good for very long. On my back it feels like sharp pinching. I touch my back and one white dot. It is pulsing a beat of my heart. For a moment I try to ignore. I try to pretend everything okay. 
but I feel another pinch. I reach back and there is new painful boil under my finger. Stupidly, I grab it and try to pull it out, hoping to end of the helping. The pain does not end. It gets very worse. As I pull the pulsing pimple out of my back, it gets long. Every time I pull, I feel sick. It is like I need throwing up, but it's not my stomach that feels sick. It is everything, my entire body, my entire soul. I stop pulling quickly, but the pain makes me scream. The bastard neighbor below bangs his broom on the ceiling and dashes starts to the barking. I want to stay in the quiet. I want to stay in the calm. But there is another pinch. I look down at my arm and scream again. White worm is coming out of my arm. There is more pinches. With every pinch I feel another pale head coming out of me. They spin and stretch trying to get out of my body. Their little black eyes blinking as they look around the bathroom. Every time I move I feel the weakness. Every centimeter I they crawl and I scream louder and louder. I feel the death. Even though I'm in bathroom in city all I smell is swamp. The worms are being everywhere. They are coming out of my legs, out of my chest. They are crawling out of me and I can feel it killing me. Screaming, I jump out of shower and I run to front door. I am ready to run to my bastard neighbor and ask for help. I do not care anything other than stopping pain. But then as I reach front door, pain stops. Tisha goes quiet and watches the worms. There is many of them now, but they stop trying to crawl out. They move back into the skin with their big black eyes and they look at Dasha. For a moment I am happy that the worms are calm, but they are a very big concern. Hoping to get help from neighbor, I put my pants on and go downstairs. While I dress, the worms are being calm. They watch Dasha and Dasha watch them. But when I leave apartment without dog, the pain starts again. As soon as Dasha is behind door, the worms start growing again. There is more worms. They are crawl from my neck. They crawl from my fingers. I start screaming again. Dasha start barking. Neighbor yelling too. I open door. As soon as worms see the dog, they are calm. Scared, I put Dasha on leash and walk to neighbor. When I knock, he's screaming. He is too blind with anger about me making noise to hear me asking for helps. It is not until he opens up eye hole and door his tone change. What happened to you? He asks. I fall in water near... <laughs> Please help me, I reply. My god, you are a stupid idiot. We're going to... <laughs> Everyone knows no man should go there. Get away from my home before you get me sick too. He says, and then he puts extra locks on door. I yell for more help, but he does not answer. He is bastard. I go back home with big concern. But when I get home, the concern grow even bigger. The worms see very interested in Dasha. When they could look at her, they do not hurt me. When their big black eye would watch her, I would not feel like I was being pulled from the inside. But not anymore. When I get home, the worms slowly start pull out of skin. Dasha is right there, but they do not too caring. More crawl from my skin. They are crazy, throwing themselves side to side as they come out. Screaming, I run to kitchen. Desha is barking behind me. Bastard neighbor is banging ceiling with broom again. Everything is madness. Everything madness and I feel like I am the dying. The worms, there have very many of them now. Their mouthless heads were starting to extend longer than my fingers. Every centimeter they grow is more screaming for me. I grab big knife and put my hand on board to cutting. <laughs> maybe I can cut off the worms. I think maybe I make screaming end. Desha was barking but also licking feet. With every lick I could feel more worms pulling from under my skin. I need to get rid of the worms. I need to cut. But as I look at my arm, all the moving life that came from under the skin, I knew that I could not cut. They were everywhere. There were too many of them. If I cut, it would be bleeding to death. But they were still pulling. I felt like I was on drunk on a carnival ride going to fist. My body being ripped out from beneath me and I transformed into massive alien life. Everything so painful. The only thing I could think of was more honey and garlic. The pain too much. I was running out of strength. 
I was thinking I am about to pass out. The worms keep on verming, growing inside me, hurting me. But then, just as I feel my legs starting to slip, all is stopping. All pain disappear. All the worms are retreating back under my skin. Their black eyes blinking and watching. Looking at the same place, the, the fridge. When I first get Dashi, she was very small dog. Her ears sometimes be wrong on her head, but they always make me smile. So I take picture when she is poppy. And put the photograph on the fridge so I can smile when I am having a bad day. Picture did not make me smile that day, but it was making the pain stop. All the worms were now watching out the skin with the big black eyes. They are all looking at picture of Papi Dasha with her ears wrong. It did not make sense, but I understood. I went to computer and finding every single Papi picture Dasha I could find. When picture on screen, worms are being calm. When picture gone, worms grow and I scream. At first I am proud of figuring out worms, but I soon start to worrying again. The longer they look at the picture, the more they blink. When they start to blink too long, they start to growing again. With screams waiting in the back of my mouth, I went on Twitter. I go to strangers around the world and I am asking for pictures of dog. In less than quarter of hour, I have many pictures of dog. Florida dog, and Scottish dog, and Thailand dog, and many people send many pictures. These pictures count my worms. I am still scared, but the kindness of strangers make me happy. I love the cute picture and some of them even make me the laughing. I have trouble thanking new friends because my English not too good and I can't do too proper explanation. So I am posting video showing what happened. I show worms. I show Desha. I tell how much hope they are bringing with their kindness. I am posting video thinking it will explain situation that it will make others happy. I am banned from Twitter five minutes after posting. Everything picture dog is taken away. I'm left with only pictures of Desha and fear. Twitter will not responding to my email or phone call. This is why I am here on Reddit. Please consider my poor soul. I am man doing the begging. I need more pictures of dog. I do not too caring if it is good photograph or not. The worms not caring too. Just please help me. I not wanting to scream again. I do not wanting to die. If worms not in my body, if worms not seeing the dog, I will be torn apart. Please send picture of dog. Bless you. If you are ever in my country and I survive this, I will buy you lunch and thank you in person. But you, if you are ever in my country, making sure you do not go to...